Okay, I'm going to try and finish up the class today because uh, I have 11 and uh, 10 and 11. I want to go to 12, but uh, you know that's just the way it goes with life. Eight, but um, I'm going to be out next week, and then the week after that there is uh, Labor Day, I believe, uh, thing that in general the church is doing, and then we start classes again. I think on the 11th of September is what they said. I'm going to teach Colossians, so I'm back to the norm because. You know, that's why I feel very comfortable in Greek stuff. And so that'll be really fun. I haven't taught Colossians before and uh, tried to match what the pastors were doing, but uh, whether I achieved that or not, that's okay. I asked them if it would fit, and they said, yeah, it'll fit, so we'll be good to go. But in this class, what we've been looking at is modern issues. We've been trying to do three things. Number one, the tools to know truth. Scientific method, legal, historical method, and logic and then apply them to problems, apply them to issues to prove, to know what we can prove. Because if you know it, we can't prove everything. There are things that we can prove. And so that's a critical thing for you to know when you get faced in the world with someone who says, well, you can't prove it. Well, there are things you can prove, and we've seen it, you know? There is limited, it's limited, but you knew that, right? I mean, the Greeks knew this. Isn't it funny? We have to relearn everything that everybody learned 2,500 years ago. And each of us have to go down that trail on our own, right? We, it's not like uh, those science fiction books you read where they have commun communal, communi communitive learning, where you're in Dune, right? The Ben and Gesuit sisters knew everything there was from the very beginning of time. If you read Dune, you need to read Dune. That's a fun yeah. book. But we don't learn that way. We have to each individually learn everything. And so it's really cool to do that. It's really important to do that. And so, again, we've gone back to the Greeks. And I've tried to, to bring you back up to where they were at the turn of the 20th century. I'm not sure what the turn of the 21st century means. Uh, maybe a return to sanity, I hope, but I don't think so. So we've tried to at least turn the, turn the clock back to learning at uh, you know, the 20th, 20th century. But in any case... The transition we've made is we looked at we looked at the easiest stuff, life issues, which led to sexual issues, which led then to private property, which then led last week to individual property, that is personal, like your body, like life type property, which then comes back to um, social issues. Now, what do I mean by social issues? Social issues are like the de definition of family. What is a family? You know, we looked at sexual issues in terms of marriage, or marriage in terms of se uh, sexual issues, but marriage has also another component, and that component is social. And by the way, it's become very important in the modern era in terms of issues. So, if you notice, I, don't int I didn't necessarily intend this, but these issues themselves come back around and are self-supporting. Self do you know what I mean by that? It's like we prove one point, and that point leads to another point, which leads to another, which then leads back to the original issues. And so all those things that we've learned or those things that we've studied or looked at all relate. So if you missed one of these classes, I'm sorry, you know, you messed up. No, that's <laughs> just a problem. Go back and look at the videos. The problem is that, that this is just like the history that I tried to teach you. You know, when I start a class, I try to lay a foundation in the historical, in his history. So with Colossians, that's what we do. I'll, let, I'll set down the history. What do we know about the history? What do we know about the documents, et cetera, et cetera? Once we have that foundation, then we can move to the other issues. But unless you have that foundation, it's going to be impossible for you to proceed. It's like that in everything in education. Like if you don't know mathematics, how far are you going to get with engineering or physics or whatever? So... And I may need to get into set theory, but I won't do it in this class. In any case, that's one of my favorite uh, things, set theory. Explaining to you why they do set theory in school. No one ever understands that, but it's really important. So, and the last point being that if you know, if you know how to prove truth, and you know there is truth, then you can use that truth in discussions with people. And we've talked about the different paradigms or constructs in logic that you basically have to be cautious of because if you begin to stray, what happens? 
What happens when you begin to stray between these constructs? Your argument gets crowded. You'll get confused, and you know, you know what? If you ever wondered, if you ever wondered why, as either a child or an adult, you couldn't win an argument, and I'm not suggesting that winning arguments is what it's all about, but the point in discussions is to put forth a, put forth your position or a position, right, and then to discuss that position with another person, not for the purpose of argument in itself, unless you know, unless you're talking about a logos to tell us in the Greek sense. But in the sense that you want to communicate your, what you know or your ideas and have a, a viable discussion with another person. But we've, so, we've seen that if you are having a scientific discussion with someone and all of a sudden you segue into a historical or a cultural context, what happens to the argument or the discussion? It's lost. It's lost. You know, if... A lot of times, and this is very important for us, usans, because a lot of times, which argument, which which construct do we want to go to? Old Testament. Yeah, Old Testament and New Testament. It was good enough to, for Paul and Silas, it's good enough for me, right? But how far are you going to get with that argument with a scientifically minded person? Or how far are you going to get with that argument with a lawyer? Unless he's a Christian, and a very strong one. How far do you get with that with a historian? Or a person who's familiar with the culture, which is everybody, right? And then, of course, we have the harm construct. We haven't talked much about that lately. But the harm construct is probably the most powerful construct we have. Where do we use the harm construct? Just, just for grins. Where do we use that all the time? Medicine. Medicine is a good example. I wouldn't even think about that, but it's true. We do use that in medicine. Where else do we use it? In the courts. In the courts the court system, because we always ask the question, what was the degree of harm? And today, and what I warned you about, remember, from the very beginning, I can't prove that words do harm, right? But in our judicial system today, if you say the wrong words, you can actually be prosecuted and be found criminally, criminally liable for words, which should really worry all of you. It's worse than that, because now aren't they trying to decipher intent? Well, the, well... What the, you might, may or may not have been thinking to try and prove that. Mm -hmm. That's the point. It's not based on what you did. Like even, you know, I, and I'm not opposed to the drunken driving laws, but, you know, drunken driving, no harm, no foul. So you're being prosecuted, perhaps, because of something you might do. Uh, hmm. Like I said, I'm not against drunk and driving laws, but I'm just saying that in every case, what do we need to know about our positions? What paradigm we're arguing. Well, what do we argue, but what they mean. For example, if you prosecute a person because they're drunk, but they have caused no harm, what are you doing as a culture? Right? If you prosecute a person for saying certain words, even though those words do not cause physical harm, Measurable harm, right? Mm -hmm. We even have diseases that have no foundation. We have diseases that have no proof text foundation. In other words, a doctor cannot prove that you have this disease or not by uh, looking at your body. But yet, we argue that that person has a disease. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. But doesn't it become gray when we talk about psychological diseases that can be caused harm because psychological diseases can then segue into physical operations. And that is a whole nother step because <laughs> you know the argument has been for years and here's the argument. What what does it and by the way, this is this is kind of a step into uh, this is step into opinion, but Science today says that what causes psychosis? Imbalance. Imbalance. Chemical imbalance in the brain, right? Science. But that's not always true. Mm -hmm. Because today science says, uh, what's the best way to treat people? What does science say the best way to treat people is? Depends on what side of the science you're on. Okay. I love this discussion because this is a really neat discussion. 
There are three ways that you, you cite, guys, you know this is absolutely true, but there are three ways to treat people. There is a thing called um, uh, Freud, Freudian, Freudian, which is dead. Freudian is not used anymore. Natural, and I used to remember this, uh, natural, and uh, what's the other one? What's the third one? Um, synthetic? No, it's from, uh, it's from, it's based in, uh, Homer? In, uh, no, Homer. It's based in, uh, I tried to say, you're cracking me up, dude, you're cracking me up. <laughs> no, it's based in, uh, in, uh, what's his name? Uh, Sorry, Kierkegaard, Kierkegaardian existentialism. Existentialistic. Existentialistic. Existential. Okay, existential. Uh, Freudian's not used hardly anymore. It's very ineffective. Yeah, about a about a five percent effectivity rate. Natural has uh, anybody know what the effectivity rate of natural is? About ten percent. And existential. Anybody know how, what the effectivity rate of existential is? It varies, but they say about eighty-five percent. Um, natural and Freudian say who's at fault? Somebody else is at fault. Someone else caused your psychosis. Your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. Uh, you didn't, you're not the cause of your own problems. What does existential do? You're responsible for your existential says you are responsible for your psychosis. In all these, na nowadays they use drug therapy along with counseling, but existential is about 85%. Guess which one Christian counselors use most? Psych psych psychs and counselors. Existential. Guess which one pastors use most? Yes. Existential. Now, why doesn't everybody else use existential if it has such a high effectivity rate? It doesn't fit their worldview. It doesn't fit their worldview. Very good. That is precisely right. You would think that we would treat... Harder to sell would be my answer. And this brings back the question about psychology. And I have no problem with psychology or psychologists, okay, or psychiatry or psychiatrists. However, the huge question has always been which is first, the chemical imbalance or the psychosis. This says that what happened first? Psychosis. The psychosis happened first, be well, the, the person became, well, if I am imagining that I have, uh, if I have caused a, a criminal crime, like remember Lady Macbeth? Hmm? Lady, Lady Macbeth had a psychosis. Why did she have a psychosis? She, caused it. she was a bad lady. She killed people for fun, right? And so, out, out, damn spot, right? Mm -hmm. Remember? Mm -hmm. So, the thing is that, that, that existential says that you caused yourself to have a chemical imbalance because you did something really bad, and you're dwelling on it. Where natural says, what happened to you? It, it was from birth, from heredity, from, you know, your parents beat you with a stick. You your parents said bad things to you. You're a bad child because... You know, you, you just poked your sister in the eye. So therefore, now you have a psychosis. In any case, I mean, this is a segue, but I think it's an important segue because the point is exactly what, what you said. If, and this is what we have to guard against, we need to make sure that our worldview is a correct worldview, right? Because if our worldview isn't based in truth, isn't based in what we can prove, then what are we doing? Walking around like this, right? You can make all the decisions in the world. How good are the decisions going to be? They're going to be silly decisions. So in any case, glad you brought that up. This is a fun fun topic. But a segue. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. A lot of that's opinion because I can't prove any of that. Well, I can prove the part of the success. And that's something I want to talk about in science if we get to there. Um, in any case, we talked about... Private property, sufficiency, self-sufficiency, that kind of thing. Let's think about this for a second. Let's talk about social obligations. <laughs> social obligations. Uh, we talked about, uh, I didn't get to the point of defense, and I really wanted to get to the point of defense and to responsibility. Let's talk about this a little bit, because this fits exactly, exactly into this discussion. That is, who is at fault? Who is responsible? In the Old Testament, New Testament con construct, which is really interesting to get to. Now, have, have any of you guys heard of Soren Kierkegaard? Soren Kierkegaard? 
you all should have heard about Soren Kierkegaard, because Soren Kierkegaard is the father of evangelical thought. Evangelical thought exists because of Soren Kierkegaard. Soren Kierkegaard is the first person to propose what is called individual salvation. We like to bandy the word around, but before Soren Kierkegaard, what kind of salvation did people have? Hmm? Corporate communal. Corporate communal salvation. As a matter of fact, because of Soren Kierkegaard, then Brock and who's there? Brock and uh, the two the two men who developed evangelical thought, and I'm not going to go into details of how that came out of Turbine in School, but there's a whole bunch of history behind that of how we got to evangelical thought. But in evangelical thought, basically the premise of evangelical thought is, and we talked about last week a little bit, because if I even asked you the question, who is responsible for your salvation? You are. <clears throat> that is what Soren Kierkegaard answered with his philosophy. With philosophy. He's the one who invented the idea of the wooing of the Holy Spirit. You wonder where that came from. You know, there are ideas. I could give you a whole list. If you know Soren Kierkegaard, you know his philosophy. He's very important because out of Soren Kierkegaard came a philosophy called existentialism. I'm not going to spell it. Existentialism. An existentialistic thought. Now, in Soren Kierkegaard was a very strong Christian. Did you know that? He's a very strong Christian. And his development of Christian, of the thought, of philosophy for existentialism, was to show how individuals are responsible for themselves. And of course, that whole idea. Now, does anyone know what the definition of secular existentialism is? Secular existentialism, out of Kierkegaard, later, this isn't Kierkegaard, is that you create your own world, therefore you create your own yeah. gods and reality. Yeah. Yes, precisely. So those are the ones that lead you to believe that you're self-empowered, self-god out, you know, let your inner god out. Bingo. And also the philosophy that there is no truth. This came out of existentialistic thought. So if you ever wondered where these ideas came from, I'm sorry, Soren Kierkegaard invented them, but out of them sprang a lot of good stuff and a lot of not so good stuff. We find that's true in a lot of cases, right? You know, the Spanish Inquisition came out of the Catholic Church. But yet out of the Catholic Church also came Franciscan missions, came the Jesuit missions, came the missionizing <coughs> of the whole world, etc., etc., right? So, and out of the Lutheran Church came the Lutheran Church and Reformation, but also out of the Lutheran Church came a lot of anti-Semitism and a lot of anti-other Christians, you know, Anabaptists were killed, right? And a lot of conflict. So, out of the good, you got to have the bad. Soren Kierkegaard, a good guy, existentialism, a good thing, good thing to study, be careful reading his stuff, it's kind of crazy, but in any case, the point is that we are, we acknowledge as a modern, or not necessarily a modern thought, but as a reasonable thought the idea of self-responsibility. Being undercut in the modern era by, well, by lots of stuff, right? We've talked about it already. The main question, however, the main question that we looked at, when we talk about, um, for example, private property, and we talked about, uh, we talked about health, and when we talked about uh, quality of life, I love quality of life. Quality of life. What did all these issues boil down to? Anybody remember? Who's paying? Who's paying? Who? All of these boil down to who pays? In other words, what's the question? Who is responsible? And if we follow Kierkegaard and extensionalism, who's responsible? Well, let's prove it. Let's prove the point. Let's look at this point because, you know, there are certain points. We haven't necessarily <coughs> proven this point. So let's look at it, and let's look at it, for example. Um, well, we can look at Old Testament, New Testament construct. I like that. Uh, we like that. Let's look at, oh, 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 I think it's Matthew. And I don't have her in down Matthew where. But anyway, 
41 and 42. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? First take the plank out of your eye, and then you'll clearly see to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Uh, the idea is that that's an idea of, uh, of mental and spiritual import that Christ talked about. That is, you know, the plank. You're supposed to worry about what? Who are you supposed to worry about the yourself. most? Yourself. Your own problems, right? Your own self, and not try to fix your brother or sister or whoever's problems, right? So, you know, mind your own business, which is very strongly existentialistic. So Old Testament, New Testament, I and mean, then we have good examples. No, Thou no. shalt not steal. I'm sorry, go well, ahead. In that story, I mean, you're supposed to fix your own problems to a certain extent and then go help your brother? Or was that basically saying that fix your own and don't worry about your others? Um, you know... Because I see a codependent <laughs> argument going on here. Codependence going on here. Um... You know, I'd love to, the, before I even want to touch that to the full extent, I want to dig into the Greek, because I think that we will find, and, I, and we did this in Matthew, I think we did this in a Matthew class a little bit, but I think if you start digging, you're going to find out that, for example, okay, a plank in your eye means what? Well, you got something stuck in your head. Right? If I have a plank stuck in my eye, I got something stuck in my head, and it's sticking into what? My brain. Right? Now, the Greeks didn't know brain, what brain meant necessarily, but it's sticking in your head. It's not a very positive thing. And you're probably going to die from it. And even if you pull it out, what's going to happen? You'll never see out of that eye again, right? And you're probably going to die from the injury. Now, a speck of sawdust. If I have a speck of sawdust in my eye, How's that speck of sawdust going to get out? Just flush it. Blinking. I blink a couple of times and it rolls down my face. And guess what? It's gone. Do you see what Christ is talking about here? You know, we, remember, I told you, is Greek concrete or metaphorical in general? Concrete. Greek is very concrete. So when I tell you that somebody's got a plank in their eye, it means there's a plank in their eye. It doesn't mean, you know, metaphorically in English we think, oh, there's a plank in their eye. <laughs> if you had a plank in your eye, you know, we'd have the doctors out here and the ambulances, and we'd have it, you know, you'd probably be dead anyway. So, you see my point? Hmm. So, I think the answer to the question is, Jesus is telling you that if you have a plank in your eye, you're dead. You're never going to see again. There's no way of helping you, really. But was he, in Greek, implying that we all have planks in our eye? No, I don't think so. He's, he's implying that, that the problems we have are like planks in our eyes. Which means what? Well, that's what right. Impossible for us to remove. Where the sawdust, the grain of sawdust in your neighbor's eye, is what? Self-removing. Doesn't require you. So what he's doing is telling you, butt out. You know, of course we need to help people, but he's also talking here about what kind of issues? Spiritual. Spiritual and issues of sin. So, I, you know... Isn't it great what we get from this stuff? I mean, I love it. Old Testament, New Testament construct. Sometimes we find stuff that uh, we could never imagine. But we need to look into Greek. That's the point. Um, in any case, self-sufficient, you know, other, other ones. Thou shalt not steal, right? And we know over and over again there are other examples in Christ's point. Now, I want to mention something I mentioned right at the beginning before. I said, in Old Testament, New Testament construct, what do you have to assume? Well, that's good from a uh, discussion of construct. I was thinking more in the sense of what you have to do with the Old Testament is you have to assume, presume, that the Old Testament is the foundation for New Testament. Oh, okay. See, in other words, Jesus Christ, you know, that's why I gave you the quotes over and over again. Jesus Christ said not a jot or a tittle of the law will change, right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, what is the foundation for Christ? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. And we teach that. So if you're going to change something in the Old Testament, what have you done? You're changing intent, big time. In the Old Testament, for example, 
The Old Testament teaches an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I bet, you know, we went to Matthew, so you guys who were not in the Matthew class didn't get this whole, I think I did, for goodness sakes, you know, five weeks on the Sermon on the Mount, even though I didn't want to. But, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, we saw that, was Christ contradicting eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth? No. No. He was affirming it. The point is that we want to read it differently because it's a paradox in Greek. He's giving a paradox. The implication is, for example, in the Old Testament, can you defend yourself? Can you defend others? Yeah. In the New Testament, can you defend others and yourself? By the way, <clears throat> who are you responsible for? Myself. Well, me, primarily, right? So am I responsible to defend myself? As a matter of fact, I'll even go further. Uh, we have a scripture, I think it's today we have that scripture about the body being the temple of God. So the body is the temple of God. Should you defend it? Yeah. Matter of fact, if you don't defend it, could you be at risk of something? Well, I think so. How about others? You know, if I see someone being molested or harmed, should I defend them? Even at the risk of my own body? Well, that's an Old Testament idea. Matter of fact, these ideas don't come from science. Uh, sometimes they're illegal. Sometimes they're historical and cultural. But mainly we get them through the Old Testament, New Testament construct. Because that's what we have focused on as a structure in our belief. But I would argue from the standpoint of responsibility, who does the Old Testament say you're, is responsible? Who is responsible? You are. Remember, even the sacrificial system, you would bring your sacrifices to do what? To be forgiven, to please God, etc., etc. And so in the Old Testament, that idea. Now, remember, the New Testament, did things change? No. The sacrifice of, of uh, sin, guilt, and ascension did, right? To Christ. And we've talked about that. I don't, get, I don't have time to go into that detail. But the point is this. The idea of responsibility wells out of Old Testament, New Testament. So we shouldn't be worried about it, right? Let's expand that idea. So the idea of, of responsibility draws down to the idea of self-sufficiency. Okay? Who are we supposed to be dependent on? Old Testament, New Testament construct says, who are we supposed to be dependent on? God, right? And God then gives us the what? Means of being sufficient. Now, how does he do that? That is the important point. Now, we will segue to these other arguments, so let's talk about this. Let's say, for example, the idea of, you're going to love this, honoring parents and honoring children. Old Testament says what? Honor, Honor your parents so you will live long in the land. Because what is that talking about? What level of responsibility or self-sufficiency, what are we talking about when we say parents and children? We're talking about family. Family. Okay, family. So if I got family... We're talking about honoring parents. We're talking about honoring children. So we just we just hit it in the Old Testament construct. In other words, children obey your parents or honor your parents. Basically, in the in the Hebrew, it says honor your parents, so you will live long in the land. What do you think that really means? And I'm not asking really opinions here. What do you think that really means? What happens when you honor parents? And especially, I'm sorry, I don't have the Hebrew here. I could really get in the Hebrew because it's, this is really deep stuff in terms of Hebrew stuff. You're talking about inheritance? Talking about inheritance? You're talking about what does your father and mother teach you? Yeah. Everything. Everything. Yeah. Teach you self 